Hi there, Gary Stearman with another edition of Prophecy in the News. Today we have with us author and publisher Dr. Tom Horn. We're going to be talking about God's Ghostbusters. Isn't that a great title for a book? We'll be right back to talk to Tom Horn. And I'm glad you're with us today because we've got a real treat for you. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, developments in the modern world as they relate to the Bible. And Tom Horn is with us. Hi, Tom. How are you? Hi, Gary. Great to be back with you as always. God's Ghostbusters. <laughs> you know, I wish I had, uh, had, had thought of that title first and saved it for myself. That's a great <laughs> title. But all kidding aside, we're living in an age now <clears throat> where this generation... It has made a swift left turn or something. We've got people uh, worshiping vampires and going out in, in, in lonely areas with uh, tape recorders and trying to record the voices of ghosts. I mean, all kinds of strange paranormal phenomena are popping up uh, seemingly at, at an ever-increasing rate. And I think your book has a lot to do with that trend. It actually does. As a matter of fact, you know, we always try to find what are the most important current trends that could also have some connection to Bible prophecy. Uh, as a publishing house, that's what we try to do. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that has concerned me increasingly for more than two years now is on the one hand how it seems to, um, we seem to be seeing the abandonment of God both by historically um, traditional churches, the preaching of the gospel, that sort of thing, mm -hmm. but simultaneously uh, an increased fascination around the world by all thing, uh, uh, for all things occultic by this culture. Like you said, vampires, uh, every television station you turn to, it's some new version of ghost hunters. Yes. Uh, some, <clears throat> and some of it, some of it is, is also, can't even be repeated on this uh, show, some of the love affairs and the, the, you know, the combinations between werewolves and some of it I can't even imagine that our yeah. kids are watching this stuff. But falling in love with a vampire or right. falling in love with a werewolf is kind of a hot thing to do these it days. It, but to me it's a ghastly, horrible uh, perversion uh, of that which God desires for man. And and yet it's being presented as, well, it's kind of a nice thing to do, you know? Well, it's very subtle. Like you mentioned, falling in love. I mean, the, the, the book series that's out there now called Twilight. Yes. And young girls, evidently, by the tens of thousands, are so enamored with what we would call eternally damned creatures yeah. of darkness. Right. Uh, who feed, uh, vampirism, of course, feeding on uh, innocent victims. Uh, it's eternal life. It's an antithesis to the eternal life that was once and forever done through Christ. And yet, these vampires have powers. That, that is to say, they're immortals. They are super strong. You know, they can jump 30 feet, so forth and so on. And it is that, I think, that people find attractive, some kind of a superhuman quality there. Well, you're right. On college campuses right now, they're saying this is one of the biggest things that young men, for instance, see these as envious. They're, they're cult icons of envious mystical strength. Young men want to be strong. But for young women, we know that psychologically, uh, women are designed to be attracted to a strong masculine figure. Yes. And so imagine how we are using young men and women their natural um, interests, their attractions, which should be directed in natural ways towards actual real humans. We're actually using that as kind of a snare to draw young people into what is, at the heart of it, deeply demonic, deeply occultic, yes. and deeply offensive to what is, it was, at least at once, a Judeo-Christian culture. Uh, and by the way, exorcists, meet in Poland, Brett Bart, to discuss vampirism, talking about how that the widespread interest in vampirism around the world right now is leading to an increase in demonic possession. Here's a, you saw this article last week, Texas vampire arrest sparks discussion on pop culture. This guy breaks into this woman's house, slams her against the wall, and is trying to drink her blood, mumbling something about, I need to feed. But the news picked up on it and said, are we 
creating an atmosphere that is conducive to either this kind of lunacy or what the church might call demonism uh, by creating so much pop culture and interest, fascination uh, with these occultic figures. And you know, all this started back in the 30s with uh, the Frankenstein and vampire movies and uh, the Count Dracula, you know. He was kind of a comic figure in a way, but he was meant to be a, a frightening person. A and when you look at, uh, at Dracula and Frankenstein, this whole theme, uh, reanimating the dead, uh, this whole theme of transcendentalism uh, coming out of Transylvania, and Transylvania, uh, by the way, is is where this meeting is taking place. Essentially, that location. Right. You know, there's a very there's a very important difference though between the early, you know, Frankenstein, uh, Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, <laughs> right? Um, yes. But if you notice that that all of the old characterizations of Dracul, Dracula, yes. um, he could be vanquished with Christian symbols. Yes. The Catholic Church, holy water. Uh, within more evangelical a train of thought, uh, driving a stake through his heart, symbolic of the cross of yes. Christ, or even holding up a cross. Holding up a cross, yeah. absolutely. So it was Christian symbolism was a power against which these things, uh, you know, could not overcome. The, the, but the modern depictions have changed in very important ways. Now, uh, in so much of the mo uh, pop media, the movies that are being made, whenever uh, somebody holds up a cross, the vampire walks up and crushes it in his hand and says, that doesn't work against me. Uh, or that's, you know, that's just baloney, that's folklore. So, so, so today's uh, young people, some of them who may take this more seriously than we would hope that they would, are receiving a very subtle message that there is a power there uh, that is equal to or perhaps even superior to the God of Scripture or to the Christ of Scripture. And, but Tom, you, you and I know the truth that uh, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. We have the power of the gospel. And <clears throat> we can hold that gospel. I mean, the movies, uh, the movie vampires may not fear the cross. But I guarantee you, the, the devil does. Oh, absolutely. Even to this very day. Yeah, that's right. And that's one thing we would want people to know. Right. Don't believe the lie. Uh, <laughs> if, if you have faith and you believe in Christ, the authority of Christ, uh, and, it's, and by the way, it's not like it's a Rocky Balboa story that somehow Jesus in the end might get in a lucky punch and overcome. There's no comparison Absolutely. between the power and the authority of Christ. Now your chapter one in God's Ghostbusters is entitled The Spirit of Nosferatu and the Children of the Dam. The Spirit of Nosferatu. Uh, Nosferatu being a, uh, a cognomen for the, the great vampire. Right. And, uh, and by the way, there was a, a German movie made way back in the 30s. It was one of the, the first and most powerful of all the vampire movies. It was called Nosferatu. Yeah, and those images still exist to this day. I mean, the, the idea of him creeping, you know, up the stairs. Oh, yeah. and he was very bird-like uh, in his appearance. There's some differences between then and now. But, of course, that German film you're talking about was probably one of the things that actually gave birth to uh, much of the fascination that then caught on here in the United States and you know we've been making films ever since then about uh, vampires. I would want people to know that this book God's Ghostbusters isn't just about vampires. It really is about those creatures of the night, the spirits of darkness, how they may manifest themselves in various ways. They may pretend to be a ghost. Well, let's they talk may about, pretend to be aliens. Yeah, let's talk about ghost hunters. You know, there's actually a, a television program called Ghost Hunters, and, mm -hmm. and there are actual, you can book a ghost tour right. with a travel agent. He will book you into several known locations of, uh, where ghosts are known to hang out. You can go spend a night and visit a ghost, and people are very much intrigued by this. Uh, and I can see what the attraction would be, you know, tickling the dragon's tail, seeing how close you can get to something and not, and, and not being terribly afraid. People love to do that. They love to kind of prove their own strength. But 
this is becoming almost an epidemic, this idea of ghost hunters. For example, you go out with a uh, some kind of an electronic device, tape recorder, uh, a digital recorder or something, and you go into a, cem a cemetery at 12 midnight. You hold the mic up and say, is anybody there? And later you co go home, you play it back, and you hear, yes. Ah, I found the voice of a ghost. But is that really the voice of a ghost that you have recorded? Yeah, and this is actually one of the interesting questions that's being raised again now. There is now a new debate in among Christian theologians about is there really any such thing as a ghost? One of the portions of scripture that are often pointed to are here in Isaiah chapter 29 where it says, And thou shalt be brought down and shalt speak out of the ground, and thy speech shall be low out of the dust, and thy voice shall be as one that hath a familiar spirit wow. out of the ground, and thy speech shall whisper out of the dust. Uh, end quote. Some of the modern translations say, say your voice shall come out of the ground as the voice of a ghost. Um, and so this is the Hebrew word ob, ob, uh, which yes. is a very interesting term because Ob can refer to uh, a spirit, but usually it actually referred to the person, the medium, mm -hmm. who was the maiden or the medium through which the spirit supposedly uh, spoke. In fact, in 1 Samuel 28, you know, where Saul, he goes down into Endor because he's heard yeah. that there is a maiden of the Ob, uh, a woman who can speak for the dead. Very true. And uh, he makes contact. Some people believe he actually talked to Samuel. Others say it was a familiar spirit. Um, but, the, but the point about this new debate is, and I kind of got into a little dialogue with a, a, a theologian a while back about this, is it does not change the prohibition in Scripture about not doing it. So whether it is theoretically possible that a person could actually communicate with the spirit of a dead human. Saul got in trouble for doing it. We're not supposed to even try. Big trouble. Big trouble. And, and then the question is, why should people, including Christians, why should they not try to communicate with uh, spirits? Because you wouldn't have any idea. What you're the, 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 <coughs> the other side is teeming with all kinds of spiritual intelligence, and a lot of it is not good. And you wouldn't yeah. have any idea what you were talking to no. or inviting into your home. Their specialty is imitation or uh, counterfeit or ventriloquism, uh, pretending to be somebody else. Right. And so you can't document that spirit to whom you have spoken, and you may well have exposed yourself to uh, a dark force which could... Uh, ruin your life, and, and, and I, I, it, I really shudder to think of all, of, of all the people who are going out and exposing themselves without armament, so to speak. Well, and by the way, that's why this book was published, because we're alarmed at what is happening around the world right now. It isn't just happening, by the way, in, in secular settings. Uh, One News Now had an article recently talking about how mysticism is invading the Nazarene organization, and we've seen so many other uh, denominations that at one time were considered to be mainstream evangelical Christian, and now uh, these people are they're, they're practicing Eastern mystical beliefs, they're trying to make contact with the dead, uh, so there's real issues. Also it should not be uh, exclusively thought of as a youth oriented issue. All ages right now. It's not just young girls falling in love with vampires. Right. Uh, all ages. And by the way, you and I have done shows on transhumanism. Oh, yeah. And, and the transhumanists, part of their aspiration is to permanently alter how the brain functions so as to open a modes of perception into what you and I would call the spirit world. Arizona State University right now has what they call the Sophia Project. And if you go to ASU's website and click on the Sophia Project uh, tab, it takes you to a page where it tells you what they're, what they're trying to do. They're, they want to verify and or make contact with ghosts, aliens, a universal mind, yeah. God. So th there, there is, it's literally almost like a, a plague. There is a disease that is spreading around the world very quickly at an alarming rate right now where uh, uh, an alarming number of individuals, including inside the church, uh, are trying to pass what? Make contact with those that are supposedly part of the afterlife. Sophia, the goddess of wisdom, 
this is the, the antithesis of wisdom as far as I'm concerned. Uh, it, it's, it's stupidity right. to expose yourself to power that you don't even understand. Right. And Sophia, of course, was the goddess who was known to also help people who wanted to bridge that gap and communicate with the other side. So they've, there's even reasons behind why they picked the, the name of that goddess. Let's talk about alien abduction for a minute. Uh, and who hasn't heard of alien abduction? You're lying in bed at night. <clears throat> Uh, you you wake up, you're you're paralyzed. You look down at the foot of your bed, and you see a little gray humanoid-looking thing, and he whisks you out of your bed and takes you up into a UFO. He keeps you for a few hours, and returns you to your bed, and and you remember nothing. In other eras, in other ages, say in the age of Martin Luther, for example, a few hundred years ago, they wouldn't have called this alien abduction at all. They would have called it a demonic encounter. Uh, the, the language is being changed. Yeah, that's right. In fact, there is a chapter in God's Ghostbusters written by Gary Bates, a well-known, best-selling author, uh, and he deals with that very issue that what some, from one uh, world view, may be referring to as contact with ghosts, Others who may be having similar experiences are referring to it as alien abduction. Yeah. And of course, he's also repeating and building on what even some secular, uh, some of the best secular UFO researchers, John Keel in Operation Trojan Horse, talking mm -hmm. about how uh, uh, demonology is not just another crackpotology. Remember him saying that? Oh, yes. It is the study of, <clears throat> the, it is the clinical study, the scientific and, and uh, spiritual study, the historical study of putting into context, contact with these malevolent spiritual forces. Malevolent spiritual forces, I'm of the opinion that the church has been robbed, uh, perhaps, of its greatest weapon against these forces, and that is the very simple knowledge of who they are and how they operate, and the fact that, uh, as we say often, he who is in you is much more powerful than he who is in the world. In other words, the, the Holy Spirit of the living God uh, is reigns supreme over all these forces, but Tom, that's that's just gone by the wayside. People no longer uh, practice a powerful uh, and knowledgeable Christianity. No, that's right. Uh, well, the church, first of all, is declining even in numbers, but it also has been in declining in terms of gospel-oriented content. And if you remove the gospel the preaching of the gospel from the church, you strip the church of its power. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power, the dunamain, the dynamite. Right. That's what can change people's lives, but it's also what can set people free and keep them on a sure track uh, in their life. Uh, now, as the church is in decline, we're seeing an explosion uh, in occultism. And by the way, you wrote a chapter uh, in this book also talking about other ways in which these spirits may be manifested, uh, what people today commonly refer to as cryptids, cryptozoological Crypto manifestations. Cryptozoology, and, and by the way, we have the, uh, the, the chupacabras running around, you know, little bizarre demonic-like creatures running around in the middle of the night. Uh, we have uh, lake monsters like Loch Ness, Nessie. Uh, very fondly spoken of as, as a lake monster, seen by hundreds of people. But strangely, when an expedition is mounted, all these lake monsters disappear. Sort of like Bigfoot, you know, that people see him, but they can never find him later And on. they not only see them, uh, in Loch Ness, they've taken very sophisticated sonar equipment and recorded very large blips of something, of something moving through the water, and then all of a sudden it's gone. It's gone. Uh, and of course, this goes way back in history. Seafarers, those also who weren't given to the bottle, right. <laughs> making uh, records of uh, the both yeah. the mermaids, which is another one of these possible manifestations, but also of these uh, dragons. In fact, the title of your chapter is, Do You Believe in Dragons? Well, uh, and in that, that chapter, I say, yes, I do, as a matter of fact. I believe in the old dragon, but I also believe in his earthly prodigy, uh, uh, progeny, I should say, who actually exist. That's, that is to say, there seem to be dragons, that is, a particular kind of reptilian that is viewed 
but can never be traced or tracked, at least not in our era. And uh, the, uh, the lake monsters, by the way, I document many of these, uh, Lake Okanaga, for example, Lake Champlain, Loch Ness, there are several Irish lakes, there's a lake in China where there's a lake monster routinely seen. They're all described as long, sinewy, reptilian beasts that have a horse-like head with little horns, and, and they scare people to death because they are infested with a, uh, a demonic spirit, Tom. And these are called Leviathan. Uh, when, when God talked to Job, he says, can you tame Leviathan? Of course, that was a rhetorical question. God knew that Job could not tame Leviathan. But Leviathan exists in the waters of this world. And uh, Isaiah talks about Leviathan. And Leviathan is a symbol of the world spirit. And I think as the Spirit of God diminishes in these last days, the world spirit will increase. In fact, the Antichrist is typified in Revelation as a, as a, a serpent-like beast rising up out of the sea. Right. Well, and so what we're really then talking about is hyper-dimensional exactly. intelligence that somehow... Uh, just like we know angels uh, came and visited with Abraham in the plains of Mamre, right. I believe. Uh, uh, they can be manifested. They can appear as something. And this then, of course, would explain why Bigfoot can leave footprints, uh, hair samples that can't be identified with known animals or bears or right. whatever throughout the Northwest, uh, even caught on film, but then suddenly disappears. Uh, and so this is another manifestation, isn't it, of it the is. same type of spiritual phenomena. I'd love to, to pursue this, but we're down to our last three or four minutes. And I, I did want to touch on another subject that's in this, uh, this book, God's Ghostbusters. The subject is shamans, sci spies, uh, uh, where people are uh, clairvoyant, uh, mediumship, where people claim to be able to see things at a distance. Uh, uh, you have a chapter in there on, on this phenomenon, which, by the way, is growing by leaps and bounds. You can now enroll in a, in a school that teaches you remote viewing, which is using your mind to see something at a distance. And it's becoming quite the fad these days. Right. Mediumship. Now, the Bible thoroughly discourages mediumship. It, it, it actually, though, there are now DMT churches that yep. are springing up. Right. Uh, and the whole purpose behind it is the use of drugs, what the Bible, what the New Testament would refer to in Revelation as pharmakia. Right. Uh, the use of a drug to stimulate certain portions of the brain for the third eye, that's what the shamans would refer to it as, to open up uh, perception so that you can make contact with the spirit world. That's why pharmakia, uh, the contact with the spirit world through the use of sorceries, and medicines. And isn't this one of the things that, was it Azazel, one of the fallen angels that came down to the earth that taught enchantments and sorceries? Yeah, according to uh, the Book of Enoch, they did indeed teach exactly this, what we would call mediumship, sorcery, shamanism, mm -hmm. uh, clairvoyance, uh, taught by the fallen angels. But again, it was mm -hmm. um, Terence McKenna, who is a well-known, he's deceased now, but he was a well-known uh, inventor, scientist, a philosopher, but he was also a shaman. Right. And he would go and use these mind-expanding drugs, but he was convinced that he had made contact on more than one occasion with uh, consistent intelligence that was somehow just beyond the veil. He too was a transhumanist that said, someday we will modify the human brain so as to create a permanent uh, pathway for communication with these spiritual entities. So from, it seems like from every quarter of life right now, you can see this interest. I did want, we're, we are gonna run out of time. There is one thing I wanted to quickly say. Okay. And that is that some people will tell you that the Bible has nothing to say about vampires. I think the Bible has a lot to say. First of all, it condemns the drinking of blood. So we know that vampirism uh, was something that was equated to the ancients. Uh, there's also, which we won't have time to get into, the screech owl in the Old Testament, which is interpreted in, in like in the 1920s versions of the Bible as a vampire. We'll have to talk about that the next time I come. Oh, yeah. But there is a very well-known uh, vampire actually uh, in the Bible. Here it is. Um, Revelation 17.6 says about the great whore of Revelation 
that's related, of course, to the coming of the Antichrist. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the wow. blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. So if you've never thought about it before, the great whore is a vampire. Time flies when you're here. I wish we had another hour. Well, it's great to be with you again, Gary. Oh, great we'll to be with you. We'll pick it up you. next time. Come maybe. back soon. And uh, this is Gary Stearman. Have a great day in the Lord. And remember, we are living in those days. So keep looking up.